Better small talk. Talk to anyone, avoid awkwardness, generate deep conversations, and make real friends. Written by Patrick King. Narrated by Russell Newton. Human beings are a social species. Connection is crucial to happiness, staving off depression and keeping healthy, literally. Various studies have shown that the effects of loneliness are akin to eating a poorer diet and exercising less, and can ultimately lead to the same place, an early death. It might sound a little melodramatic, but companionship is literally the way our brains have been built to survive and thrive. But for the purposes of this book's topic, there's an even more important wrinkle. The quality of our interactions matter as well, not just the quantity or presence of other people around us. Sounds like even our brains despise small talk. A 2010 study by Matthias Mell had participants wandering around in their daily lives armed with a device that would record their audio environment over three days. The researchers analyzed how long each participant was in the presence of other people and whether they were having casual conversations or were talking about more substantive matters. Basically, the aim was to capture what kinds of interactions these participants were taking part in and the effect they had on their lives. At the same time, the researchers also measured people's overall level of happiness and mental and physical well-being. They found a clear correlation between substantive and deep discussions and greater well-being and happiness. It's something you've probably suspected or even felt before, but being vulnerable and open with others is a deeply satisfying activity on many levels. As for small talk, that which is the opposite of substance and depth, well, it drew a negative correlation with well-being and happiness, meaning it made people less happy. There you have it, real evidence that small talk is something to be avoided, or at least transition out of as quickly as possible. Researcher Arthur Aaron conducted a study in 1997 in which he paired participants who didn't know each other and gave them a list of fairly personal questions to ask. Although the questions were not offensively intrusive, they were more than just small talk. How would you like to be famous and how? Do you have a secret hunch about how you'll die? What is your most terrible memory? How do you feel about your relationship with your mother? Aaron found that the participants responded to these deep dives with openness and intimacy. The participants didn't feel that the questions, as personal as they were, necessarily invaded their privacy or weakened them in any way. Instead, these questions encouraged honesty, more emotional fluency, and sincerity in the respondents. They felt closer to the other participants, who were complete strangers before the experiment. Future iterations of this study were given names such as How to Fall in Love with 36 Questions because of the powerful effects it had on the relationships between the participants, which were previously non-existent. You probably already know, deep in your bones, what these two studies laid out. Delving more deeply or intensely in our communications can create positive results far more swiftly than one might think. Now the question remains, how can we actually do that? In this book, I want to provide a framework from beginning to end about how to engage people more effectively and move beyond small talk. We'll start even before the interaction begins with how you should prepare yourself and move on through all the stages of small talk to arrive at something more meaningful. At the prospect of reading this book, you might be overly excited about throwing yourself into the midst of a conversation and seeing what you can accomplish. After all, you're reading this book for a reason, and motivation can make you over-eager. But rushing in would be a mistake for the time being. It would be akin to running into battle without your shield, sword, or even pants. The Small Talk Mindset There's more to conversation than thinking off the cuff and creating witty banter out of nothing at all. Very few of us are capable of doing that on a consistent basis. And what's more sustainable, easy, and practical is preparing for a conversation beforehand. To be specific, you're not preparing for specific conversations like their job interviews. Rather, you're priming yourself to be able to shine in social exchanges in general. 
there's a distinct difference between the two. When you prepare for conversations, you'll find being witty much more available and even easy. So the first step to witty banter and small talk is to get ready psychologically, so you're not caught with your pants down in meeting someone new. What exactly does this mean? Think about when you just wake up and your voice is gravelly and incomprehensible. Your thoughts are unorganized and swirling, and anything that comes out of your mouth is likely to be responded to with a, What did you say? When you're only half awake, you're caught off guard when you have to respond to anything, and you have a lack of focus and awareness. This is our social status quo, how we'd normally move through and navigate the world. So, warming up mentally is about beginning to stretch and gingerly flex our social muscles so we're ready for action. If you're out at a bar or networking event, you only have one shot at making the right impression. If you fall flat on your face, as will inevitably happen from time to time, guess what? That was your one shot at the goal. Will you make the most of it? Recall that as children, we were always admonished to never talk to strangers. This well-meaning instruction might have served us well in our childhood, when we were likely to be gullible prey to sly criminals. Stranger danger was a real thing to be avoided. In public places, we plug our ears with headphones and glue our faces to our phones, preferring to keep our interactions with people we don't know to the bare minimum. Is this habit still serving us well? Likely not, if our goal is to become better at conversation and charm. We should quickly let go of this tendency because, as adults, it only serves to keep us isolated from others. It locks us in a social prison of our own making, and it keeps us socially cold for occasions when we need to be on. At the very least, it leaves us woefully unprepared for engaging with people, exposed as if we were ambushed in the middle of the night. A 2014 study by Epley and Schroeder divided commuters on trains and buses into three groups. The first was instructed to interact with a stranger near them, the second to keep to themselves, and the third to commute as normal. Even though participants in each group predicted feeling more positive if they kept to themselves, the outcome of the experiment was the opposite. At the end of their ride, the group of commuters who connected with a stranger reported a more positive experience than those who remained disconnected. It seems we feel that only awkwardness will ensue with a stranger when instead an unexpected connection creates good vibrations. In support of the above findings, another study by Sandstrom and Dunn, 2013, revealed how being our usual efficiency-driven selves while buying our daily cup of coffee is robbing us of an opportunity to be happier. While we routinely rush through the transaction without so much as a smile, the study found that people who smiled and engaged in a brief conversation with the barista experienced more positive feelings than those who stuck to the impersonal, efficient approach. These studies have two main findings. First, we tend to think or assume we're better off keeping to ourselves than having short interactions with strangers. Second, we're wrong about the first point. The simple act of engaging people in short bursts has been shown to make us happier and more inclined to be social, and it will also help us mentally and psychologically warm up to be our best in conversations and small talk, no matter the context. We need to engage in more short interactions, or what researcher Stephen Handel calls 10-second relationships with others, because they have the potential to boost our moods, change our perspectives, and warm us up socially. Of course, though we may not recognize the benefits of short interactions, it's still understandable how the thought of striking up a conversation with a total stranger may be uninviting, or even repulsive to those of us who aren't social butterflies. We feel ill-equipped to engage in fruitful social interactions, so we prefer the loneliness of keeping to ourselves. How do we counter this and warm ourselves up for routinely conversing with others? How do we get into the habit of being interested in people and build enough social confidence so we can turn that interest into meaningful interactions? Well, that's part of the logic behind only trying for 10-second interactions. Hey, 
You can make it for one second. Hello there. Or five seconds. Hi. How's your day going? Great to hear. Bye. Depending on your level of comfort. But keep the goal small and stay consistent. You constantly encounter multiple opportunities for warming up to interactions and building your social confidence. For instance, think of your typical day. On your way to work, how many people do you spend at least some time ignoring, whether those you pass by on the street, sit with on your commute, or stand beside in elevators? Greet at least one of those people with good morning and offer either a compliment, nice coat, the fabric looks cozy, an observation, the sky is cloudless today, looks like the showers are letting up, or a question. I see you're reading John Grisham. Which of his novels is your favorite? For lunch, do you eat solo, hunched over your work desk? Try instead to spend your lunch hour someplace with shared seating, such as your office pantry or a nearby picnic area. Sit beside a colleague you always see in your building yet never got the chance to talk to, and get the conversation rolling by asking about recent company events. I heard your department is starting a new leg of research. How's it going? Finally, as you pick up groceries on your way home, chat with another shopper mulling over products in the same grocery aisle you're in. I saw this sauce in an online recipe. Have you tried cooking with it? At the checkout counter, smile and greet the cashier. How's your shift going so far? This segment of society is especially suited to help you practice and warm up. In fact, they don't really have much of a choice. Baristas, cab drivers, cashiers, the grocery bag boy, waiters, doormen, valets, their job performance depends on their customer service skills. And if they want to keep their jobs, they have to be courteous to you. This alone should eliminate the fear you have of crashing and burning in any social interaction, because it's their job to prevent that and probably laugh at your jokes. You'll see that crashing and burning is never really that bad, and people move on quickly they'll probably forget the interaction within the next 10 minutes. There's also typically a captive audience behind the store counter or cash register. These employees are usually stuck being stationary in a position for long periods of time. And for those who have held the above jobs, you know that it's not the most thrilling life. Most of the time, they are bored out of their minds, so having someone engage them will be a positive experience for them. You will make their day pass faster and just give them something to do. You might be the only one to treat them with respect and show actual interest in them as a person, which would undoubtedly make you the highlight of their day. In other words, they'll be glad to talk to you. With service people, you can test different stories, reactions, phrases, greetings, facial expressions, and so on. Unless you offend them in a deeply personal way, these people will still be courteous to you, but you can gauge how positive their reactions are to all of your tactics to know what works best. You can continuously improve and hone your skills. You can witness your progress with future interactions. As you see their reactions change, you can fine-tune what you're doing and keep stepping up your game. Essentially, you're in a safe environment to practice and polish your social skills without fear of any judgment or consequences. More than that, you can learn to read people, process their signals, and calibrate your interactions to different types of people. This is a process that takes trial and error, but you can speed it up exponentially by engaging with the people you come across. So make it a goal to initiate and create a 10-second interaction with a stranger each day, and especially on the way to functions, events, and parties. This will warm you up for conversation and build the habit of being interested in people. A Childlike Exercise Warming yourself up psychologically and getting into the general mood to socialize on a daily basis are important aspects of being great at small talk, but just as important is the way you prepare your body. Think of it this way. Conversation is a race, and you have to warm up and prepare yourself accordingly. When we want our best race, whether athletic or academic, we always engage in some type of warm-up. 
it's almost common sense at this point that you need to prime your body and mind to the kind of performance that you want. Runners stretch. Singers sing scales. What about people engaging in conversation? Well, you might be surprised by how much help your speaking muscles need and how getting them in shape can make you instantly more charismatic. Recall back in grade school when you weren't paying attention, the teacher called on you, and you had to spend five seconds clearing your throat while still sounding meek and awkward because you weren't prepared? That's what we are seeking to eliminate, as well as imbuing you with a sense of confidence. To warm up your conversation and small talk skills, you just need to do something you've done almost every day in our lives. Read out loud. It sounds simple, but reading out loud this time will be different from any other, because you will have a purpose. I've provided an excerpt from The Wizard of Oz, which is in the public domain, for those copyright police out there. If this doesn't pique your interest, you can feel free to find your own excerpt. Just try to make sure there's a multitude of emotions included, preferably with dialogue from different characters. Here it is. After climbing down the China Wall, the travelers found themselves in a disagreeable country, full of bogs and marshes and covered with tall, rank grass. It was difficult to walk without falling into muddy holes, for the grass was so thick that it hid them from sight. However, by carefully picking their way, they got safely along until they reached solid ground. But here, the country seemed wilder than ever, and after a long and tiresome walk through the underbrush, they entered another forest, where the trees were bigger and older than any they had ever seen. This forest is perfectly delightful, declared the lion, looking around him with joy. Never have I seen a more beautiful place. It seems gloomy, said the scarecrow. Not a bit of it, answered the lion. I should like to live here all my life. See how soft the dried leaves are under your feet, and how rich and green the moss is that clings to these old trees. Surely no wild beast could wish a pleasanter home. Perhaps there are wild beasts in the forest now, said Dorothy. I suppose there are, returned the lion, but I do not see any of them about. They walked through the forest until it became too dark to go any farther. Dorothy and Toto and the lion lay down to sleep, while the woodman and the scarecrow kept watch over them, as usual. Seems like an easy task, right? Go ahead, and try to read the above excerpt out loud to yourself. Don't be shy. If you actually did it, you'll notice that you do literally feel warmed up and more ready to keep speaking and conversing after just using your vocal cords for a bit. But that's just the beginning. Now comes the instruction. Pretend like you're reading the excerpt out loud to a class of second graders. Read the excerpt like you're giving a performance in a contest, and the winner is judged on how emotional and ridiculous they can be. Pretend you're a voice actor for a movie trailer and you have only your voice to convey a wide range of emotion. Go as far over the top as possible, which, granted, won't be much at first. Exaggerate every emotion you can find to the tenth degree. Scream parts of the story while whispering in other parts. Use different and zany voices for different characters. Make any laughter maniacal. Make any rage boiling. Make any happiness manic. You get the idea. For that matter, what emotions are you picking up in the text? Even in such a short excerpt, there are emotional high and low points. Express them, and make them sound like climaxes to stretch your range of emotion. Pay attention to your voice tonality. Are you accustomed to using a monotone? Would someone be able to tell what the character or narrator is thinking or trying to convey by listening to you? Use the excerpt to practice your range of vocal expressiveness. Try to embody the term emotional diversity. Go ahead and try it for the second time with all this newfound instruction. Did you hear a difference? Here is some additional instruction. Pay attention to your diction and how you enunciate. In a sense, you are literally warming your tongue up so you don't stutter or stumble on your words when you talk to others. This is another reason to have an excerpt with dialogue. The greater the diversity of the text you are reading, the
the better warmed up you will be. If you have the habit of muttering like a curmudgeon, put a stop to it and make sure you're speaking clear as a bell. Pay attention to your breathing. Do you feel like you're running out of breath? It's because your diaphragm is weak and not used to projecting or sounding confident. That's the reason singers put their hands on their stomachs. It's to check that their diaphragms are engaged. Try it and make sure that your stomach is taut and tight. The point here is to literally breathe life into the words that you're speaking. Those who speak without their diaphragm inevitably come off as quiet, meek, and mouse-like. The better you can project your voice, the wider the emotional range you can create. Another key element of how you say something is, of course, your pacing, the speed at which you talk. Your speaking speed can either be your friend or undermine what you're trying to say. Rate of speech can imply an emotion all by itself. For instance, when making a big point, you should slow your pace to allow the impact to be felt. If you use the wrong speed or your pacing is off, a lot of what you have to say can easily be lost or confused and misinterpreted. In addition, well-timed pauses can say just as much as an expression through words. Ready to read through the excerpt one more time? Make sure you're utilizing everything you just read. Now, compare your third version to the first version you did without any instruction. That's the difference between warming yourself up and not. And most likely, the first version is how you're coming across the vast majority of the time. Hopefully, that's illustrative enough evidence for the benefits of warming up. Was this exercise, along with all the included direction, a massive challenge for you? It's probably a good idea to evaluate how unexpressive you are coming off in everyday conversations. The added bonus is that while you're feeling silly and over the top, you are actually stretching your limits in terms of emotional and vocal expressiveness. The simple act of getting out of your comfort zone, even in private, will extend your boundaries and make you more expressive and confident-sounding in general. All this from reading out loud? Yes, if done with purpose and deliberation. Your Conversation Resume Previous points in this chapter about pre-conversation have centered around your psychology and your physiology. In other words, to hit the ground running and have great small talk, you've got to find ways to put yourself in the mood for it. However, we haven't covered what to actually say yet, have we? Now we'll rectify that. As mentioned before, conversation isn't always about thinking quickly on your feet in the heat of the moment. That's an entirely different skill that can be developed. But what's more easy and useful on a daily basis is to create for yourself a conversation resume, which you can draw from in nearly every conversation. What the heck does this mean? Well, a couple of things. First, we don't really think about ourselves and what is interesting about us to others. Have you ever played the game Two Truths and a Lie? It's a social icebreaking game where you're supposed to name interesting facts and stories about yourself. But this is pretty difficult for most of us, because we simply don't often ask ourselves, what do people want to hear about us? Constructing this resume helps confirm your identity, quirks, accomplishments, and unique perspectives. In fact, it helps us gain self-awareness and self-confidence. Second, when we're in the heat of a conversation and an awkward silence is looming, sometimes we stress and our minds blank completely. We try to think on our feet, but our feet are frozen to the floor. A conversation resume comes to the rescue, because it is an annotated overview of who you are. It's a brief list of your best and funniest stories, your notable accomplishments, your unique experiences, and viewpoints on salient and topical issues. It allows you to keep your best bits ready for usage. It's no different from a resume you would use for a job interview but with a very different purpose in mind here. Know your personal talking points, rehearse them, and be ready to unleash them whenever necessary. However, just like in a job interview, having this resume allows you to present the version of yourself that you most want others to see. 
It may seem inconsequential to have such thoughts prepared, but imagine how excruciating the silence is in a job interview when you have to scramble, think of an answer on the fly, and respond while knowing your words are generic or useless. If someone asks you what your biggest flaw is, you won't have to grasp for straws and instead can begin expounding on why the fact that you are too dedicated and work too hard can be a flaw. It's the difference between having a good answer or story when someone asks, what did you do last weekend, versus simply saying, oh, not too much, some TV, what about you? And how few of us can answer the following without stuttering and stalling. So what's your story? The conversation resume allows you to remind yourself that you're not such a boring person after all, and that people should have reason to be interested in you and what you have to say. Developing and constantly updating your conversation resume can save you from awkward silences and make it nearly effortless to connect with others. It may feel difficult to come up with right now, but imagine how much easier it will be without the stress of someone staring at you waiting for your reply. It's this process of mental agony that will translate to real conversational success. What you come up with on your resume won't always make it into everyday conversation, but the more you have it on your brain, the more it will be apparent to others and the more captivating you will become. There are four sections to your conversation resume, and it's not a bad idea to update them every couple of weeks. Admittedly, you may never have thought to answer any of these questions before, which means these parts of you definitely aren't coming through in conversation. Don't sell yourself short. Keep in mind that if someone asks you a question, you don't have to answer them literally, and instead can redirect them to something else that you've prepared on your conversation resume. After all, when someone asks, how was your weekend? They don't necessarily want to know about the weekend. They just want to hear something entertaining to fill the silence. Daily life. What did you do over the weekend? Anything notable? How is your week or day going? Anything notable? How is your family or significant other? Anything notable? How is work going? Anything notable? Personal. What are your hobbies? Anything notable? What's your biggest passion or interest outside of work? Anything notable? Where are you from? Anything notable? How long have you lived at your current location and worked at your current job? Anything notable? Where did you go to school? And what subjects and activities were you involved in? Anything notable? What do you do for work? Anything notable? Notable. What are your five most unique experiences? What are your five most personally significant accomplishments? What are ten strengths, things you are above average at, no matter how big or small? Name 10 places you have traveled in the past five years. Name the past five times you have gone out to a social event. Name 10 things you cannot live without. Don't take this question too literally. It's asking about your interests, not household staples. Staying current. What are the top five current events of the week and month? Learn the basics and develop an opinion and stance on them. What are four funny personal situations from the past week? Be able to summarize them as a brief story. What are the four most interesting things you've read or heard about in the past week? Be able to summarize them as a brief story. If you've ever felt like your mind was going blank, this is the cure. There are so many pieces of information that you've just dug out of yourself that it should be nearly impossible to run out of things to say. Remember to review this resume before you head into socially intense situations, and you'll be able to keep up with just about anyone. You just may realize that while some people appear to be quicker than lightning, they may simply remember more about themselves at that moment. 
Conversational stages. Look, small talk gets a bad rap. But failing to understand the value of small talk is like saying you want to be married but hate dating. One typically leads to the other in a very sequential manner. The first thing to remember then when attempting to improve your social skills is that small talk has a very important place in the art of conversation and mastering it will get you to the big talk a lot faster. Conversation and, by extension, socializing and cultivating relationships with people, is something that happens by degrees, not all at once. Zoom out and you can see where small talk fits in and why it's so important. It's the first of many steps in closing the distance between you and another person. It can be useful to think of conversations as occurring through four different stages, each one progressively more intimate. By gradually securing trust and rapport with the person, you're more likely to lay the foundation for a good relationship. Similarly, race through these steps, or get them wrong, and you may well get off on the wrong foot and ruin a potentially good connection with someone. The first level is, no surprise, small talk, also known as exchanging pleasantries or general chit-chat. This is getting a conversation off the ground from a cold start. It needs to be small. Conversational warm-up should center around a topic that everyone will be able to comfortably engage with. After all, at this point, you don't know the person in front of you at all. Weather, very general current events, or something that is happening in the moment are all good topics. This stage is not about sharing who you are, per se, but making contact and starting things off on a positive foot. Avoid anything too intense or specific, prolonged eye contact, or physical touch. Keep it light and smile. Your goal is to comfortably move along to the next stage. Following small talk, you may both feel relaxed enough for the second step, fact disclosure. This is a getting-to-know-you phase where you can start sharing details of your life, where you work or live, interests, what you're doing at the moment, or something that connects to the previous small talk or the position you both find yourselves in currently. You get the chance here to open up a little more and share yourself as a person, which allows trust and confidence to build. However, keep in mind that this is fact disclosure. Keep strong opinions and emotions out of the picture for now. Let the other person get to know you gradually, and only increase intensity if they're comfortable and are responding to your disclosures with their own. If not, it's okay. Just stay at this level. If they return your information with some information about themselves, you can likely move along to the next stage. The third stage, opinion disclosure, brings you both closer still. Finding common ground allows you to share viewpoints and opinions. Finding what makes both of you the same is a deliberate attempt to seek out grounds for friendship. Without prying, ask thoughtful questions that will let you find a potential area of similarity. You may need to chat for a while to stumble upon some shared reference or common opinion, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a massive connection. If you've done your small talk well, and you've disclosed some useful facts about yourself, and listened to what you've been told in turn, you can start to find interesting points of commonality to discuss. Did you study a similar subject at university? Do you both have kids? Or do you share an unusual interest? The context of your conversation will determine how in-depth you go. A random chat to an interesting stranger at a bus stop is likely to be a little more shallow than meeting your sister's new fiancé. But the steps will be the same. Good conversationalists know how to keep their ears pricked for facts and details they can draw on or ask questions about. People can be really fascinating if you only ask them the right questions. Be aware, however, that if you haven't been too successful at the previous stages, seeking out a shared connection might feel a bit forward or unwelcome if the other person wants to move more slowly. You may accidentally uncover a source of friction, and you need to be able to fall back on some good rapport and friendliness from the previous stages. 
Conversation is a fine balance. You want to connect with others, but need to stay respectful and observant, and maintain a comfortable distance as you get to know the other person. Simply understand that opening up honestly to another person takes time and trust, since it could lead to plenty of discomfort or misunderstanding. Move on to the third stage only if the conversation feels relaxed and positive. The final stage of emotional disclosure is where you open up even further and share personal feelings directly. This has to be genuine. Everyone has different thresholds for this level of intimacy, so it's important that conversation partners are both authentically trusting and comfortable with one another. Hence, all the previous stages. You might talk about something you're excited or fearful about, or share a sincere compliment or private opinion. Of course, a good relationship will stay in this final stage and deepen when it comes to mutually sharing emotions and more vulnerable ideas. Whether it's a romantic, business, or family bond, getting to this stage takes effort and is not to be taken for granted. Though small talk might seem like a waste of time to some, think of it more like a commitment to laying the early foundations of a closer relationship down the line. Takeaways We are a social species, and multiple studies confirm this. Lack of social interaction itself is harmful, and for our purposes, lack of substantive social interaction is no better. Gaining the ability and skill to fast-forward through small talk has incredible value for the relationships in your life, old and future. However, before we jump into conversation tactics, it's helpful to start before we actually meet and greet someone. How can we prepare beforehand to have consistently great small talk and interactions? In many ways, it turns out. There are a couple of ways we can get ready for small talk and warm up, so to speak. The two approaches are what you might assume, physiologically and psychologically. Psychological preparation is a matter of getting in the mood to socialize and also becoming used to initiating interaction. This can be done with 10-second relationships, which you plunge into the deep end, if only for a moment. The idea is to start small and short, with low expectations, and build from there. You'll eventually see that it's easy and quite safe. You might even find it enjoyable and frequently want to extend past 10 seconds. Physically, you should seek to warm up by reading out loud before socializing and making sure you exaggerate emotional expressiveness and variation. Read a passage out loud three times and notice the difference in engagement and you can instantly see the contrast in how you might come across. You should act like a teacher reading to grade school age children and run through the whole gamut of emotions, expressions, and voices. Go over the top. This is meant to warm you up, as well as bring awareness to how lacking in expressiveness you probably are on a normal basis. An additional way of preparing before conversations is to get your own information and life in order. And this can be done by following a conversation resume. The purpose is to draw into your past and find what makes you an interesting person and make sure that is all at the tip of your tongue for easy usage. We often forget what we can bring to a conversation and this lack of available topics adds a sense of stress and avoidance. We all dislike small talk but it does have a role. Getting to know someone happens in a sequential manner, and we cannot skip steps if we want to go deeper. It can be said that there are four stages to an interaction, and small talk is the first, followed by fact disclosure, then opinion disclosure, then emotion disclosure. The sequence can be played with, but understanding small talk's role is important. Most people don't barrel into conversation head first. Rather, they gently dip a toe in and test the waters. If you've never met someone before, you naturally feel like you should first remain reserved so you can calibrate your interactions, read your new acquaintance, and determine how familiar or relaxed you can be. For instance, 
Remember when you were in elementary school and you found out you would have a substitute teacher the next day? It was a scary moment for most, unless you hated your normal teacher. It was scary because you never knew how strict or vicious the substitute would be, and you'd have to be on your best behavior for a few days until you figure them out. Who knew if this substitute was the type to whip out a ruler and smack you across your knuckles, or ferociously dress you down for daring to step out of line? The next morning, suppose the substitute teacher walks in with impeccable posture and addresses everyone as Mr. and Miss, even though you're eight years old. That's the tone they chose to set, which is obviously not ideal for you. But... What if the substitute teacher were to walk in with an untucked shirt and sandals and immediately address the class as buddies and dudes? I'm not saying one is superior to the other, but a tone is intentionally being set out by each of these teachers. It shows you how they prefer to interact with the students and how they want to be treated. In conversation, and especially when small talk commences, we're sending the same signals, but we probably don't realize it. We're all sizing others up in a similar way, and people are doing the same to you. They look at how you carry yourself, which lets them know what kind of interaction you might prefer. So, what kind of substitute teacher do you appear to be to strangers, acquaintances, and even friends? Knowing you're making an impression on everyone you meet, you should be cognizant of setting the right tone with others. What kind of signals are you sending? For our purposes, we ideally want to send a signal of comfort and familiarity. It's understandable that you may not feel comfortable being the first to reach out, but it's too often that this causes a game of chicken where there's no movement at all. We keep ourselves from small talk success by talking like strangers, sending signals of discomfort and distance, and simply acting as if we aren't yet friends. When you treat people like strangers, strangers they will remain. Setting the tone means making the mental leap to we're friends now and treating them as such. Set the tone. At the risk of sounding redundant, at the most basic level, this means to speak like friends and stop conversing with everyone like you've just met them at a professional networking event. How do friends speak exactly? I've got a useful personal anecdote to share on how friends, familiar acquaintances, and those who quickly make friends speak. It was a couple of years ago, and you'll never guess who the other party was. We had a short back and forth exchanging the normal pleasantries and how-do-you-do's, and then we got right to business. It wasn't particularly what my conversation partner said to me. It was the approach she had. My conversation partner essentially had no filter and whatever came to her mind, she asked. This was refreshing, as most day-to-day -day banter can be uniform and vanilla, without a clear path to something more substantive or interesting. Some people like to shallowly jump from topic to topic and not truly engage, and this was the opposite experience. The lack of a filter means the conversation will go places that are interesting, emotion-driven, and somewhat inappropriate. Of course, the best topics are always somewhat inappropriate. Very few topics are truly inappropriate. You just have to speak about those topics in an appropriate manner. Speaking to someone who wasn't beating around the bush for the sake of remaining appropriate was refreshing. She wasn't afraid of asking the deep and tough questions, no matter how often she had to ask, but why, to understand something. Often, our conversation went down a hole that others would have avoided. She had to ask a few times before I realized myself what I was saying. There was no judgment, and it was apparent that her questions were motivated by sheer, genuine curiosity. It made me feel comfortable being vulnerable and sharing my more private thoughts. In essence, we had skipped past most phases of small talk and sniffing each other out and dove right into the deep end and spoke like people who had known each other for a long, long time. Surely, this is the type of interaction correlated with general well-being and happiness that was discussed at the opening of this book. You got me. The conversation partner 
was an eight-year-old I met at an acquaintance's barbecue. For most of us, we have trouble with conversation when we think about it too much. We analyze in our heads, attempt to plan, and unnecessarily filter what we have to say. What comes out may be overly formal or stilted through overthinking. No matter how exciting or emotionally engaging the thoughts swimming around our noodles may be, what makes it out of our mouths can be downright dull. We stick to the tried and proven safe topics. We filter out the excitement and intrigue because we don't want to rile any feathers or because we are self-conscious ourselves. Children do not have this problem, and that's the tone they set. As a result, we all act a certain way toward inquisitive and social children, don't we? We follow their lead. This is always the choice you have as well. Just to be clear, the point is certainly not to act like a child, nor even childlike necessarily. It's just to understand that we all send certain signals when we interact with others, and children send very unique ones that typically open us up and make interactions fun and entertaining. Remember not to be so literal and serious. A playful, relaxed attitude, like the one you already have with your friends, is just right. Be less predictable and give unexpected, unconventional answers. If someone asks you how the traffic was, don't offer a merely descriptive, accurate answer. Make something up, or say the opposite of what you mean. Sarcasm in a nutshell. Play with language and use colorful phrases and expressions. Your car is your chariot. The sun is as bright as Elton John's sunglasses, and the orange is as sweet as a truck full of synthetic sugar. You can bring in some lightheartedness simply by exaggerating a little, being absurd, or going over the top in a way that makes people sit up and take notice. At a stressful doctor's appointment, a father may lighten the mood by looking at his pouting toddler with a deadpan expression and saying, Doctor, is it too late for adoption? You may find it effective to deliberately misinterpret a situation in a completely absurd way. If someone says that they love little kids, well, you can fill in the blank there. Pose hypothetical questions to gently break people out of the regular humdrum of life, or do a silly role play. You're at the library, and someone's pencil rolls off the desk and toward you. You catch it and pretend to scold the pencil, but then look sadly at the other person. I'm really sorry, but I don't think your pencil likes you anymore. Sarcasm is another tool. An acquaintance asks you how your day at the DMV was, and you smile broadly and exclaim, Fantastic! How have you been? It's just gorgeous this time of year, stuck inside that luxury hotel. Sometimes, deliberately drawing attention to the situation you're both in can also create a feeling of camaraderie. When you break the fourth wall, you talk about exactly what's going on, perhaps having a conversation about the conversation you're having. Many difficult exchanges have actually been revived by someone having the courage to say, Wow, so this is a little awkward, huh? If you, for some unforeseeable reason, happen to spend 20 minutes discussing the merits of chest hair, this would be fair game to point out as a self-referential dig. How do you act like friends otherwise? There's no pretense. There's assumed familiarity. You say what's on your mind. You show your emotions. And you ask deeper questions born out of curiosity. The next time you spend time with a group of friends, try to sit back and analyze the interaction in front of you. How are people relating to each other? What kind of questions is everyone asking? And what are the signs that you are all comfortable and familiar with each other? Also, pay close attention to the topics being thrown around. You'll notice very quickly that they adhere to the small talk stages from the previous chapter. Some facts will be shared, such as stories from people's lives or funny events. Then people will engage in opinion sharing and exchange, and delve even more deeply into how those opinions impact emotions. Sometimes it is better to play it safe and be cautious with how we present ourselves. However, those instances do not comprise the majority of our lives. The biggest lesson from this section should be that we are indeed capable of setting the tone, and most of us do it in a way that is self-defeating. 
but we are capable of changing that if we put in a little effort. Make the first move. We're ready to start chatting. Of course, I'm talking about breaking the ice. For most of us, this is what we imagine when we're trying to create an initial impression. To be frank, it's not that we don't know what to say. Just like when we forget someone's name, we know the most direct path to getting what we want. We should just ask. And so the easiest and most direct way of breaking the ice is to just say hello and introduce your name. But this isn't helpful for most of us, because we typically feel too uncomfortable to be so direct. Thus arises the need for sly tactics to accomplish what we want through indirect means. Our discomfort happens for a multitude of reasons, summed up by the feeling that we're interrupting people or otherwise inconveniencing them. We have trouble breaking the ice with strangers, even though it's such a simple thing, because we create a they'll think or what if feedback loop in our brains. What can I say to avoid being awkward? What if I'm interrupting them? Will they think I'm stupid? What if they're busy? What should I say? What can I say? For instance, if we chat up a stranger or barge into two people already having a conversation, we're afraid they'll think I'm a weirdo. They'll think I'm a creep. They'll think I'm rude. They'll be annoyed. What if they want to speak in private? What if they hate my face already? It doesn't matter that these aren't true. We think they are true. So they block us from easy solutions to the problem of breaking the ice. In the matter of making introductions, we need to find tactics to undercut the judgments and assumptions we make of ourselves. So how can you feel okay about breaking the ice? By doing it indirectly. In other words, having some sort of excuse or justification to speak to someone. When we've come up with a reason, suddenly it's easy to interrupt people or walk up to a stranger. For instance, suppose you are intensely shy and nervous. You eschew most forms of social interaction. But if you were utterly lost and on the verge of exhaustion, would you have a problem walking up to someone and asking for directions? Doubtful, and not just because of necessity. You'd feel that you have a compelling reason to speak, and that would override your fear of judgment. That's the meaning of indirect in this context. You have an actual reason to approach someone, and when we can create one for ourselves, we can convince ourselves to take action more easily. In other instances, you might refer to this as the feeling of plausible deniability, where you have a plausible reason to walk up and start a conversation in a way that no one can think you're rude or weird. Actually, if they think you're rude or weird, they're the rude or weird ones. Therefore, I want to present three indirect methods of breaking the ice that help you feel safe, because you aren't necessarily walking up to someone just for the sake of starting a conversation. The biggest part of the battle is making breaking the ice feel acceptable. It's an I-don't-feel-confident-or-comfortable issue more than an I-don't-know-what-to-say issue. Recall that asking for directions on the verge of exhaustion makes all of those worries secondary. The first indirect method of breaking the ice is to ask people for objective information or a subjective opinion. These can be very legitimate and important questions that would necessitate speaking to a stranger. It doesn't necessarily matter that the person you're asking knows the answer. It's just a way to begin a dialogue. For that matter... It doesn't even matter if you don't know the answer. Excuse me, do you know what time the speeches begin? Do you know where the closest Starbucks is? What do you think of the CEO's speech? Do you like the food here? The first two examples are inquiring about objective information, while the latter two are asking for a subjective opinion. The second indirect method of breaking the ice is to comment on something in the environment, context, or specific situation. It can be as simple as an observation. Imagine you're thinking out loud and prompting people to answer. Did you see that piece of art on the wall? What a crazy concept. The lighting in here is beautiful. I think it's worth more than my house. This is an amazing DJ. All the rock ballads of the 80s. 
Notice how these are all statements and not direct questions. You're inviting someone to comment on your statement instead of asking them to engage. If they don't choose to engage, no harm, no foul. You're not putting any pressure on them to respond, and you don't necessarily need to expect an answer. The third and final indirect method of breaking the ice is to comment on a commonality you both share. For instance, why are you both at your friend Jack's apartment? What business brings you both to this networking conference in Tallahassee? What stroke of misfortune brought you to the DMV this morning? So, who do you know here? So how do you know Jack? Has Jack told you about the time he went skiing with his dog? The idea with these commonalities is that they are instant topics of conversation because there will be a clear answer behind them. These indirect icebreakers aren't rock and science, but their main value is to make you feel okay with engaging someone in conversation, which is the real problem. Eventually, you may get to the point where you feel comfortable just walking up to someone and shaking their hand. But in the meantime, you can get started here. Find Similarity Think back to the last time you met someone new at a networking event or party. What was the first topic out of your mouth? It was probably one of the following. Where are you from? Who do you know here? How was your weekend? Where did you go to school? What do you do? Do you live far from here? While these are normal, small talk questions, we ask them instinctively, not because they're great at breaking the ice. In fact, as you well know, they're usually terrible for breaking the ice and can make people feel immediately bored. You may have had a negative physical reaction at reading those prompts. We actually ask these questions instinctively because we're searching for commonalities. We're searching for the Me Too moment that can spark a deeper discussion and thus improve the first impression. For instance, if we ask the question, Where did you go to school? We're hoping they attended the same university as us, or a university where we have mutual friends. The next natural question is a variation of, Oh wow, what a small world. Do you know James Taylor? He also went there around your time. While you may not realize it, you are always hunting for similarities. And similarities are another way of setting a tone of friendship, familiarity, comfort, and openness. It's the type of feeling you share with your friends, and the same feeling that can instantly skyrocket your rapport. As much as we would like to think that we are open-minded and can get along with people from every background and origin, the reality is that we usually get along best with people who we think are like us. In fact, we seek them out. This trait is why places like Little Italy, Chinatown, and Koreatown exist. But I'm not just talking about race, skin color, religion, or sexual orientation. I'm talking about people who share our values, look at the world the same way we do, and have the same take on things as we do. As the saying goes, birds of a feather flock together. This is a common human tendency that is rooted in how our species developed. Walking out on the tundra or in a forest, you would be conditioned to avoid that which is unfamiliar or foreign, because there's a high likelihood it would be interested in killing you. Similarities make us relate better to other people because we think they'll understand us on a deeper level. If we share at least one significant similarity, then all sorts of positive traits follow, because we see them as our contemporary, essentially an extension of ourselves. When you think someone is on your level, you want to connect with them because they will probably understand you better than most. Suppose you were born in a small village in South Africa. The population of the village ranges from 900 to 1,000 people. You now live in London, and you're attending a party at a friend's home. You meet someone that also happens to be from that small village in South Africa, just eight years older, so you never encountered each other. What warm feelings will you immediately have toward this other person? And what assumptions will you make about them? How interested will you be in connecting with them and spending more time together in the future? What inside jokes or specialized points of reference can you discuss that you haven't been able to with anyone else ever? Hopefully, that illustration drives home the value of similarity 
and how it drives conversational connection. So as mentioned, we typically use small talk questions to find similarity, but there are better, more effective ways to discover commonalities with people. For instance, we should always be searching for similarities or creating opportunities for them. They both take effort and initiative. Let's talk about searching for similarities first. We can search for similarities by asking probing questions of people and using their answers as the basis to show connections, no matter how small. Ask questions to figure out what people are about, what they like, and how they think. Then, dig deep into yourself to find small commonalities at first, such as favorite baseball teams or alcoholic drinks. Through those smaller commonalities, you'll be able to figure out what makes them tick and find deeper similarities to instantly bond over. Just as you'd be thrilled to meet someone from that small South African town, you'd be ecstatic to meet someone who shared a love of the same obscure hobby as you. It doesn't take months or years, and it doesn't take a special circumstance like going through military boot camp together. It just requires you to look outside of yourself and realize that people share common attitudes, experiences, and emotions. You just have to find them. Get comfortable asking questions and digging deeper than you naturally would. Is it odd for you to ask five questions in a row? It shouldn't be. It might even feel a little invasive at first. Find the shared experiences and use them. For each topic, you can find some part to relate to and connect on, instead of digging around a variety of shallow topics like a job interview. Don't stop at the initial topic. If someone says they love baseball, for instance, you could try to understand why that is and what makes them such a fanatic for a game involving hitting a ball with an oversized stick. Suppose their love for baseball came from their father, to whom they are particularly close. Well, you have, or had, a father at some point, also with a relationship, hopefully good. That's quite a powerful similarity. Searching for similarities will come more easily in most cases. In addition to searching out what is already there, we can create opportunities for similarities in a few ways. First, physically, by mimicking people's body language, voice tonality, rate of speech, and overall manner of appearance. This is known as mirroring, and it has also been shown to produce feelings of positivity when tested. Anderson, 1998 all you have to do is arrange yourself to resemble others in order to benefit from feelings of similarity, from how they are posed to how they gesture. You can mirror their words, their tone of voice, and their mannerisms. Keep in mind that mirroring is not just about reflecting the person on a wholesale basis. Instead, it's all about communicating to them that you share similar values and have the potential to connect intimately. You can mirror physical signals, gestures, tics, and mannerisms. For example, if you notice that someone uses a lot of gestures when talking, you should do the same. Similarly, if you notice that someone's body language involves a lot of leaning and crossing of arms, you should follow their lead. You can mirror their verbal expressions and expressiveness, tone of voice, inflection, word choice, slang, and vocabulary, emotional intonation, and excitement and energy. This has the overall effect of making people feel more heard, feel more subconsciously comfortable and familiar with you, and fostering feelings of closeness relatively quickly. The second way to create opportunities for similarities is to ensure that you share a healthy amount of personal information and divulge details, probably more than what you're used to. What did you do last month? Statement 1. You went skiing last month. Statement 2. You went skiing last month with your two brothers and you almost broke your foot. Thank goodness you have a background in dance, so you were able to keep yourself from serious injury. Which of those stories is easier to relate to and find a similarity with? Obviously, the second version, since there is literally four times as much information. If you're having trouble connecting with others, it's likely you're expecting to find a similarity without sharing anything yourself. Let's do another one. 
How does your week look? Statement one. This week seems pretty busy. Statement two. Pretty busy. My mother-in-law is coming into town, so that should be fun. I think I also need to find a cobbler and an ice cream cake for a party I'm going to. If sharing even this amount of detail feels uncomfortable and unnatural for you, it's a sign you probably don't give your conversation partners much to work with, and you are essentially dropping the conversational ball when it is hit back to you. You may be the cause of awkward silence more often than not because others will expect a back-and-forth flow, but they end up doing all the work while you wonder what's wrong. In other words, get used to this feeling of discomfort because it's something you need to improve upon. Aside from searching for similarities and creating opportunities for them, consider that mutual dislike is also a useful bonding agent. Have you noticed that it is sometimes impossible for the conversation to remain positive, and the conversation will veer into a set of complaints about something you both dislike? Simply put, mutual dislike creates a sense of excitement that can often be more powerful than mutual like. For instance, discovering that you both went to the same restaurant, were served by the same waiter, and both hated him. It's easy to discount these interactions because people think talking about negativity is a negative thing. However, it's not negative to talk about negativity because it's an emotion like any other. And the more emotion you can generate in your interaction, the greater an impression you will make. What's ultimately important is seeing eye to eye in some fashion, preferably one that is about your opinions, views, emotions, or choices or decisions. They can be positive or negative. The goal is just to converge on something. Manufacture Connection Sometimes, despite all the groundwork you've put into setting a friendly tone, making the first move, and even digging out some underrated similarities, people won't engage too much. Some people just aren't very forthcoming. Conversing with them can be like talking to walls for no apparent reason. You can ask them something seemingly innocent, and they just dodge, demur, or give you a one-word answer. Whatever the case, conversation has now come to a full stop. Unfortunately, they have set the tone to treat you as a stranger and hold you at arm's length, which is something we are making sure we don't do ourselves. The reasons for this can vary, but most of them are not related to you. Moreover, often we cannot control this, but that's okay. There are ways to move past this type of engagement, if you're certain that they're actually interested in engaging with you versus stonewalling you in the hopes that you leave them alone. In a sense, this is you manufacturing a connection out of nothing at all, at least whatever your conversation or small talk partner is giving you. This is where the practice of elicitation comes in. It's a type of questioning that uses a specific conversational style to encourage people to share and speak more. It was originally developed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, for use during interrogations, but was quickly adopted by corporate spies to obtain confidential information from competitors. Its origins will probably give you pause, but all of these techniques can be used for both good and evil. The methods themselves are neutral and are a result of taking a look into the human psyche. To use elicitation, you make a statement that plays on the other person's desire to respond for a variety of reasons. The other person will feel driven to respond, even if they had no prior interest in engaging. They will almost feel like they have no choice. A direct question will not always get an answer. Thus, it becomes important to ask indirect questions to encourage opening up and creating engagement. Here's an example of how elicitation works. You're trying to plan a surprise party for someone, so you need to know his schedule, his friend's contact information, and his food and drink preferences. Of course, you can't ask him for this information directly. So, how might you indirectly obtain this information from him? Ellen Naylor, in her 2016 book, Win-Loss Analysis, wrote about a few elicitation techniques to get people talking. Recognition People thrive when you recognize something good about them. Mention, I love your sweater, 
and you'll get a story about how the wearer obtained the sweater. Mention, you're very thorough. And you'll get a story about how the person went to military school and learned to be thorough at all times. They may have been tight-lipped before, but any chance to enhance praise is welcome. People have a natural desire to feel recognized and appreciated, so give them an opening to show off a little. You can also show appreciation to someone and compliment them. This is similar to recognition. People rarely turn down an opportunity to explain their accomplishments. Complaining We've covered this a bit in talking about how people love mutual dislike. People also love to complain, so it's easy to get someone to open up by giving them something to commiserate with. You complain first, and they will jump at the opportunity. If they don't join in, they might open up the other way by feeling compelled to defend what you're complaining about. Either way, you've opened them up. You might tell someone at work, I hate these long hours without overtime pay, and he will agree and go into more detail about how he needs money from not being paid enough. This may lead him to disclose more about his home life and how many kids he has and marital issues he has related to finances. It may also lead him to defend the long hours. Either way, you have more information now. Key to this technique is creating a safe environment for people to brag, complain, or show other raw emotion. If you complain first, you establish a judgment-free zone. They don't feel like they'll get in trouble with you. You don't have to complain to kickstart this. Just express your own negative emotions, vulnerabilities, or disappointments. Correction People love to be right. This is truly the backbone of any Internet argument. So if you say something wrong, they will gladly jump at the chance to correct you. If you give people an opportunity to flex their ego, most will seize it happily. An easy way to do this is to state something you know to be obviously incorrect to see if they will step in and break their silence. See if they can resist this primal urge. Naivete To be clear, this does not mean to act stupid. It means to act like you're on the cusp of understanding. Acting naive makes people feel compelled to teach, instruct, and show off their knowledge. People just can't resist enlightening you, especially if you're 95% of the way there, and all people have to do is figuratively finish your sentence. I understand most of this theory, but there's just this one thing I'm unclear on. It could mean so many things. People won't be able to stop themselves from jumping in. In the spirit of elicitation, here are a few indirect methods that I've discovered work quite well for me personally. When you ask a question you think may not be answered, ask as if they answered it and react to that hypothetical answer. You. So, I hear that project didn't go so well at work? Bob. Yeah, not great. You. Yeah, I heard things were going excellent, minus that little snafu at the end of the quarter. But that's no one's fault. That part of the project is super complex. It's crazy. I can't believe it even got the green light. When you put all of this on the table, it's going to be nearly irresistible for them to step in and answer, reply, correct, confirm, or deny. That's the important part. You are, one, asking a question, two, acting as if they answered the question, and three, then seeing how they react to your assumption of their answer. Don't wait for them to react to your question. Just give them the opportunity to react to your subsequent answer. The premise here is that even if they don't want to talk to you, they'll be forced to engage and step in to intervene in some way. You may not get the merriest of answers, but the important thing is that you've gotten them to open their traps in the first place, and that can be the hardest part of all. There's another variation on this method of getting people to engage or otherwise speak up. When you ask someone a question, assume they're going to answer a certain way, and keep elaborating on that sentiment. Again, if you're lucky, people will feel compelled to correct you and clarify what their actual answer to the question is. You. So how was the vacation? 
I bet it was terrible with all those worms and alligators. I hate the water and humidity so much. Bobby. Well, actually, gotcha. In the same vein, you can elicit people to speak and open up more by talking about something you know is obviously wrong and waiting for them to jump in. You. That relationship seems so good because he has a nice car, right? That's all you need. I guess when it's a Corvette, it's enough. Money is life. Bobby. Well, actually... These methods capitalize on people's instinct to set the record straight. Even if they don't want to talk about something, they don't want the incorrect or negative perception floating around about them. If you were only getting one word out of them and you're able to eke two sentences out of them by using this tactic, consider it a win to keep building on. Remember that the tone of an exchange is something you have 100% ability to set. Many of us feel that conversations are a matter of luck. You strike it lucky by finding a mutual topic of interest or similarity, and those instances are necessary to create rapport. Of course, if you believe this to be the case, it will be the case for you. Takeaways What determines whether you hit it off with someone? It's not circumstantial. Rather, it's a matter of you taking charge and setting the tone to be friendly and open. Most people treat others like strangers and thus won't become friends. So change that script from the very beginning. Put people at ease and let them be comfortable around you. The first way to set the tone is to speak like friends, topic-wise, tone-wise, and even privacy-wise. People will go along with the tone you set as long as you aren't outright offensive. A powerful aspect of this is showing emotion, as friends do, instead of filtering yourself and putting up a wall for the literal purpose of keeping people insulated at a distance. And stop being so darn literal and serious. A conversation does not have to be about sharing facts, and some comments can be used solely for the purpose of seeing how the other person will react. Another aspect of setting the right tone is to search for similarities, and also allow the opportunity to create them. When people observe similarity, they instantly open up and embrace it because it is a reflection of themselves. There are only good assumptions and connotations, so we should actively seek them out. You can do this by digging more deeply into people's lives and asking questions to find seemingly unrelated similarities, divulging more information about yourself, and also mirroring them physically. Also, don't discount the value of mutual dislike. It's not negative to talk about negative things per se. Finally, even if you follow these steps, sometimes people either aren't willing to engage or not good at opening up themselves. You can blast past this by using forms of elicitation in which you put forth a topic or question in a way that a person will feel compelled to engage or elaborate. These take the form of prompting the person to reply to your recognition, encouraging mutual complaining, assisting your naivete, and correcting your incorrect assumption or information. This has been Better Small Talk. Talk to anyone, avoid awkwardness, generate deep conversations, and make real friends. Written by Patrick King. Narrated by Russell Newton. Copyright 2020 by Patrick King. Production copyright by Patrick King.